It's going to be our third session on the book of Philippians um, and today we're going to look at some examples of Christian faith uh, from chapter 2. Uh, but before we start I wonder if we could just have a short prayer and then we'll crack on because we've got a fair bit to get through. Heavenly Father we thank you for the people we've known over the years who've, who've um, displayed your love and your goodness and we pray now that you'd help us to see you in these four examples of faith that we're going to look at now. In your name, Amen. amen. Okay, so um, I explained in the first session that the book of Philippians revolves around this hymn poem in chapter 2 and Tim took us through that last week. Um, but in session 1 I looked at some Christian priorities and as I said just now, we're going to look at some examples of faith in this session. Um, <clears throat> Paul next week is going to look at chapter 4 because that has a number of pastoral uh, issues. And uh, Tim's going to finish up with chapter 3 in the last session. So that's kind of where we are at the moment. And we're going to look at four examples of the Christian life, which are role models for us. But they have a number of shared characteristics, the same for all four of them. And this is a kind of quick recap of chapters 1 and the first um, half of chapter 2. They have the same Saviour and Lord, the servant King Jesus. They have the same Christian identity because they're in union with Christ. They have the same need for prayer as plants grafted to him. They have the same God working in their lives, making them more like Christ, bringing their lives to completion in, on the last day. And they belong to the same Christian family, they're God's children and co-heirs with Christ. And you notice the common denominator in all of those things is Christ. And we're going to have a look at uh, four individuals, uh, Timothy and Epaphroditus, going to look at a couple of things about Paul and then I want to share something with somebody I met a number of years ago uh, called Reinhard. Um, Philippians 2, this is the key passage. We have the same Saviour and Lord. Um, he's humble because being in the very nature of God, he didn't consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather he made himself of nothing taking on the nature of a servant. He was obedient even to death on a cross and then he was exalted after the resurrection. Uh, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name, <coughs> name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that he is Lord. And then um, in the first session we looked at the fact that we had the same Christian identity, that we are holy people in Christ, that our status is that we're holy, a set apart from the, the, for the purpose of worship and service. But we're also to be holy in the world, but set apart from worldly values. That we're partners in the gospel. Um, that word partnership is in the Greek koinonia, which is otherwise translated as fellowship or community with a shared responsibility to share the gospel. And that includes both defending against untruth and confirming what is truth. So the Greek word for defending is apologia, from which we get the word apologetics. And of course we're sharers in God's grace, the undeserved kindness and mercy of God, irrespective of money or merit. You can't buy it, you can't earn it. And the Philippian church shared kindness in sending Epaphroditus to help Paul with financial gifts. And the church identified with Paul in his suffering in prison. We have the same need for prayer. Um, we looked at Philippians 1, 9-11, which is one of Paul's uh, fantastic prayers. And we saw that um, when, we're, when we become a Christian, God seeds, um, sows the seed of love and, and knowledge within our heart and mind. And when we're born again, that seed is germinated and begins to grow. 
but that growth is supported by a trellis or a, a stake of insight and discernment, it, which stops us um, from being protected when damaging wind and rain comes, but it points us in the right direction. And as time goes on, the plant grows the fruit of purity and blamelessness and righteousness, the inner character and the outer conduct of Christ, to whom they are grafted. And eventually there'll be a harvest on the day of Christ and God will receive the glory and the praise to which he alone is worthy. So that's this prayer of Paul's. And of course they have the same God working in them carrying on to completion, making them more like Christ and enabling them to share the good news about Christ uh, in a manner worthy of the gospel, with the courage to stand firm against the attacks of the gospel and possibly sometimes to suffer for the gospel and to show the love of Christ in their unity, having one spirit and purpose, being like-minded, showing Christ's compassion in care for others and to be blameless like bright stars in a crooked generation. And of course God is working in them to enable them to serve with selflessness, uh, looking to the interests of others, to be obedient and to be faithful in the knowledge that um, Christ will, has been exalted as Lord. So now we're going to come to Timothy, Epaphroditus and Paul and the first thing I want to say is that they belong to the same Christian family. They are God's children, co-heirs with Christ. Timothy was probably about in his 30s when this book was written. He came from mixed heritage, we'll come to that in a minute. Paphroditus, probably in his 40s, reading between the lines, he was a Macedonian Gentile. And Paul, by now, was probably in his 50s, a Jew and a Roman citizen. But the thing they had in common, despite their different ages and race, was they all had the same Heavenly Father to whom they cried Abba. Paul, Paul describes himself as like a father in chapter 2 verse 22. He says, Timothy as a son with his father. Timothy is by implication his son and at the beginning of the two pastoral epistles to Timothy he, he says, he writes to Timothy, my dear son. Obviously he's not his biological son, but he's his son in the Lord. Paphroditus, he calls his brother, my brother and fellow worker. And like a father, Paul in many ways is strict but kind. He's a good teacher, not just of the word the, and the skills we need, but the attitudes. He sets the tone, if you like. And at this stage, he has overall oversight onto the, of the new churches. Timothy is his apprentice. He's teachable, he's enthusiastic, and he actually will come to be Paul's successor in many ways. And Epaphroditus was one of those guys, we all need them in the church. They're dependable, they're hardworking, they're hands-on, they're willing, they take, you know, they'll do anything you want them to do, and we all need the Epaphrodites in the church. And so uh, our focus of, is on the things that we have in common, that Jesus is our Saviour and Lord. Um, and we focus on his nature and his work, his humility, his teaching and healing. And our similarities, uh, the fact that we have the same father, the same identity and the same needs to grow and to be prayed for and to pray. And our focus is not really on our differences, um, our age and gender and status, our nationality, our culture, our background. Um, we need to focus on, on Christ. Uh, we need to have our eyes open to him. Um, so let's look at Timothy. Um, so I'm going to read the uh, five or six verses that um, apply to him. <laughs> From Philippians 2, 19 to 24. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. 
For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served me with the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him to as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. So we know from the book of Acts and, and uh, Paul's letter to Timothy, to Timothy, that his mother was called Eunice. She was a Jewess and, her, uh, and a Christian believer. His father was a Greek, a Gentile, so he had a mixed heritage. His grandmother was called Lois and she had a sincere faith. And uh, Paul tells us that Timothy was taught the scripture from infancy. Um, Rembrandt, or attributed to Rembrandt in the mid 1600s, painted a picture of Timothy and uh, his grandmother. And I know he, it's rather sort of Renaissance clothes and so on, but uh, the grandmother's kind of pointing to, to, the, to the word. And Timothy is at her, her lap. He's got one sort of hand on her lap and the other on, on the word of God. And uh, I don't know about you, but it's difficult to see, but her gaze is almost as if she's looking at into what Timothy might be like in the future. But the interesting thing to me is that a couple of obscure verses in the New Testament, and they are relatively obscure, kind of uh, uh, inspired Rembrandt to paint a picture. And, um, and we all need to pray for our grandchildren and and our children, whether they're our biological children or adoptive children. We all have adoptive children in the church and we need to pray for those who teach them the scripture from infancy, whether they're family members or whether they're youth workers in the church. It's a great example to us um, because you never know, they might turn out to be like Timothy. He was from Lystra, which is in Asia Minor, or now southern modern Turkey. We're not sure when he was converted. It could have been through childhood, but it could have been through Paul's first visit to Lystra and his first missionary journey. But from an early age, he seems to have had a good reputation among the other Christians. It says in Acts 16 that the brothers spoke well of him. But he seems to have a number of uh, mixture of things in his personality. Um, when Paul was writing, we know he was young. Um, Paul said, don't, look, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. Flee the evil desires of youth. He seems to be quite a timid man. Um, Paul exhorts him not to be ashamed to testify about the Lord. And when, when you read the pastoral epistles, you get the sense that he's, he's needing affirmation and encouragement. Um, and then um, he's, he seems to be physically frail in some respects. Um, Paul says, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ. And the scriptures say he suffered from frequent illness. He had a, a stomach ailment requiring medicinal alcohol. I put a last couple of al asterisks there to suggest that perhaps some stomach ailments are not always helped by alcohol. <laughs> uh, medicine has moved on a bit in the last 2,000 years. It's possible that you may need an endoscopy and uh, various other things. So, you know, don't burn a hole in your stomach, but basically that's what we're saying. Um, but on a serious note, remember that God sometimes chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Um, now getting to the sort of heart of things, there are, there are three things which I think um, Paul describes about Timothy. He's got genuine care, he put Jesus first, and he had a servant heart. He takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Now, I looked up this word uh, for interest, that's how it's translated in the NIV. It's a Greek word, merimna. Bear in mind I'm not an expert on Greek at all. But in the King James Version, it's translated care. He takes a genuine care in your welfare. But that word is also translated anxious or care in other scriptures. So Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you have many cares 
and it seemed to me, I can only say from my own experience, there's a bit of a thin line between caring and being anxious about somebody. Um, but I can only speak for myself. But in any event, that's a, not a superficial or fleeting type of care. He gave of himself with full attention. And, and it, it was a concern for the whole person, both their spiritual, emotional and physical well-being. He put Jesus per first. He, he looked out uh, for the interests of other people. And again, that word in the Greek is sateo, look out for, is translated seeks in the King James Version. In other words, he searched intently. And that same word is used by Jesus in the Sermon of the Mount. Seek first, look out first for the kingdom of God. Don't Marimna, don't worry about what you will wear or what, we, what you will eat and so on. Uh, and it basically it means putting the interests of Christ before yourself and it may involve a sacrifice of time and energy and money and so on. And um, finally he had a servant heart. He served Paul with the work of, in the work of the gospel. And that work, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, the word is deleo, in, or to do service. And it reminded me of the operational, mo operation mobilisation ship called the Doulos, which is the noun of that. And the Doulos w went all over the world serving Christ, taking aid and literature and so on. And I gather there's a second one called the Doulos Hope. Um, <coughs> but basically the ship was commissioned to serve the Lord. And Paul served as Paul's apprentice, apprentice as a son with his father. And Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. You either deleo, God, or money. Um, and I, I looked at all the references to Timothy in the New Testament, got my concordance out, and it seemed to me that he had a number of roles in the church. He was a companion to Paul and Silas on their missionary journeys. He was a fellow worker with them, spreading the gospel. Importantly, he was Paul's messenger. He was taking and bringing back news between Paul and the churches. He was taking Paul's news and he was reporting back to Paul about the condition of the churches. He was a preacher. Uh, he was also a letter sender. Six of the New Testament letters, 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians and Philemon, He's the co-signatory. I don't think he was the main author. I don't even know whether he proofread them, but he, he was, Paul said, um, he, he wrote from himself and Timothy. And then later on he had oversight of churches, particularly Corinth and Ephesus, uh, taking over from Paul uh, in Christian oversight. So here's a man who's young and timid and frail, He's, he genuinely cares, he puts Jesus first, and he has a servant heart, and he's a fellow worker and faithful messenger, and, and latterly a church leader. And Paul says of him, I have no one else like him. And, and I think like Timothy, we are a, a mixture of weaknesses and strength. We all have our faults, we all have our strong points. Um, but Paul says in, in other letters that if we use our gifts for God's glory, we will be commended by him, and that's the most important commendation that we can ever get. So be encouraged like that. So we're going to come on to Epaphroditus. It's a slightly longer reading. Um, but I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. So Epaphroditus has already, he's visited Paul in prison, and he's taken the gifts from Philippi, uh, of mainly money to, that Paul needs to survive in prison. So it's, I think it's necessary to send back to you, Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad 
and may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honour, and sorry, and honour people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. And then, uh, 4.18, the last chapter, I'm amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the <laughs> gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. So Epaphroditus was a, a Macedonian Christian. He was probably in his 40s. He belonged to the church at Philippi and the church had this <coughs> history of repeated generosity. It was a generous church and actually I think Thornhill is a generous church and we have a history of generosity. His name is only mentioned twice um, so we don't know much about him, only what Paul said, tells us. But he, his name means charming so I imagine him as a likeable man and in many ways I think to do what he did demanded a certain likeable personality. Um, and little is known about him except for what Paul <coughs> describes. Um, he was a trustworthy messenger, fellow worker, disciplined soldier, prepared to take risks, nearly died and was concerned for others. And I'll just put this little map in here. It's about 650 miles from Philippi to Rome along the Via Ignatia and the Via Appia through Italy. Um, it's a long way to go. Um, and this man was a trustworthy messenger. Um, to take gifts of money all that way, you, you can't choose someone who's greedy or dishonest. You can't choose a Judas. You have to choose someone who's, who's trustworthy um, so that the money was used for the, in, the, um, for the purpose for which it was intended. And it had to be a man of faith as well because you know, it's a long way to go. Um, just to get along the road, uh, you have to have faith in God to provide and to guide you. And no, no doubt there were dangers along the way, weather, hunger, bandits, injury, who knows. And even when he got to Rome, he's got to actually find Paul and get in to, to see him. So it, it's not an easy journey. Um, he was a fellow worker. I think there's his uh, likeable nature probably enabled him to work alongside others with Paul and with Christians in Philippi and other people he met along the way. And surely he was motivated by love. So he, he, he worked with all his strength, his physical strength and his heart and his mind. And Paul says um, later on in Philippians that that work will be rewarded, that people who work for the Lord will have their names written in the book of life and th that will be credited to their account. This is not salvation by works, this is reward for works done, obviously, not to mix up the two. And finally, he was a disciplined soldier. A soldier needs to be trained and reliable, obedient to his commanding officer. A soldier today has to be willing to give his life for king and country. It was uh, Epaphroditus sacrificed or nearly his life for the King of Kings and the Kingdom of God. And of course, as a soldier, he would, be, he would need to be equipped with armour for defence against the enemy. And Ephesians 6 goes through all of those things, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, etc. He was prepared to take risks. And it's, it's quite interesting that the word uh, risk is, is actually it's, I think it's the only time it's used in the New Testament, but, it, but in the Greek otherwise it's a word which is used of gambling, believe it or not. Uh, and it's as though he gambled his life to help Paul. And there was a group in the early church called the Parabolani, um, the gamblers, and they went around taking risks for the sake of others. They, they took risks for the poor, they took risks for the sick, um, what we now know as infectious diseases. But you know, they knew that if there was a plague that they could suffer from the plague. Uh, you might say the NHS staff, before we actually knew about COVID, took some risks for our sake, um, uh, before we really understood the nature of the disease and how it spread. And when we did know. 
<laughs> yeah. And he, he nearly died. Uh, we don't know what he had wrong with him. We don't know if it was, it was hunger or exhaustion or he, whether he picked up an infection or he got injured. But we, what we do know is Paul said he nearly died. We don't know how he recovered. Did he receive help from a good Samaritan? But the thing is that we're all susceptible and sometimes we can be struck down in, you know, and it can be completely unpredictable. And there are times when we all need to be cared for, we need prayer. The other thing about him that comes out in this passage is that he was, he was deeply concerned um, for others. Um, he was sent to take care of Paul, chosen by the church. But then Paul says he longs to be back with you, to be with the Philippian church, so that they could be reassured that he'd recovered, because word would have got to them somehow that he was ill and uh, he, he wanted to reassure them. And it's interested um, when Paul says he was, he was distressed that you heard that he was ill. Um, and that's, that word in the Greek is actually used of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, so it's obviously something which is a very profound sense of being distressed or troubled. He was deeply distressed. He was concerned for the way that they were feeling. And um, Paul says, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and, and honour men like him. And so we, we, the thing I think we should learn from that is that we are to welcome in the Lord um, good examples of faith as, as we would Christ. Um, welcome with joy um, as Christian brothers and sisters, not with resentment or mixed motives, but, but welcome people, learn from them, honour them, they're often ordinary men and women of faith and service. And just to be desire to be like them, more trustworthy and willing and caring, and maybe sometimes to take risks. Uh, a couple of things I just want to mention about Paul from, from uh, Philippians 2. Um, just by way of a background, remember Paul was in prison, um, probably in Rome. Um, I take that. Personally, I think it was probably Rome because the internal evidence in the letter was that he mentions the palace guard and Caesar's household. But we don't know the exact circumstances and the date. He may have been in a prison cell. In a, there might have been a period of imprisonment which is not mentioned in Acts. Or he may have been in his own rented house uh, as described in Acts 28. Um, but we don't know. What we do know is that his movements were restricted, either metaphorically or physically, he was in chains for Christ. And he wrote this letter to the Philippians to report his own circumstances and his future hope to visit the Philippians, to encourage them to stand firm, to thank them for the gift delivered by Epaphroditus, to exhort them to humility and service and to warn them about the danger of false teaching and wrong attitudes, um, um, legalism and liberalism, and, and Tim will be dealing about with that in the last session. Um, but he, he seems to have two particular concerns in, um, in Philippians 2. Um, he wanted to receive news about Philippi and how the church was doing, and he hoped to send Timothy to visit them. And he wanted to send Paphroditus back, as I just mentioned, to reassure him, the church, that um, Epaphroditus had recovered from his illness. Um, the first thing I want to say is that actually the thing that comes through in Philippians 2 is Paul's confidence in the Lord. He knew that God was in control, that he was sovereign. It wasn't the Roman soldiers, it wasn't even the Emperor Nero, because he knew that nothing could happen without God's permission. He knew that, uh, that Jesus was Lord, that he'd risen from the dead and was exalted with the Father in heaven and that one day every tongue would confess Jesus as Lord and at, at the name of Jesus every knee would bow. Even Emperor Nero one day would have to bow to Jesus as Lord. And he trusted God um, even though he was in this very difficult situation. He sensed the, the nearness of God, the nearness of the Lord, and he need not be anxious. And with prayer and thanks, he presented his request to God and exhorted us to do the same. 
and he learned contentment in every circumstance that he found himself. He was confident in the Lord. But he had his own human needs. Um, he needed his, he had physical needs for food and warmth and uh, we know from Acts that he, he, he wanted writing materials. Um, he had emotional needs um, into, in the second chapter of Philippians. He, he needed to be cheered and he, he needed to be spared from sorrow upon sorrow. Um, and obviously he needed friendship and fellowship, people with whom he could pray and worship God. He just needed company. But the amazing thing was that he was willing to let them go. He was willing to let Epaphroditus return and he wanted to send Timothy to visit Philippi. He could have asked them to stay and keep him company um, and to continue to help him. But he put the welfare of the church before his own need. Um, I think Paul is actually amazing character. <laughs> he sometimes gets a little bit of bad press but actually when you get into Paul he is an amazing guy and he's a man of integrity. He taught each of us, each of you should look not only to your own interests but to the interests of others and he practiced what he preached. Um, I want to just um, um, digress for just one minute and give you three examples of what I've called letting go. When Paul was on his third journey coming back towards Jerusalem he stopped at a port called Miletus and he called for the elders of Ephesus, the church at Ephesus where he'd spent over two years teaching them and being with them and they had this meeting at this port and it says when Paul had finished speaking he knelt down with all of them and prayed they all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. And what grave them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. They, then they accompanied him to the ship that was going on to Jerusalem. So the elders of the church at Ephesus let Paul go for the sake of the gospel. And then there was David and Jonathan. Do you remember David who was fleeing from Saul? And Jonathan and David hatched this plot which would warn David uh, as to whether, door, uh, whether Saul was going to kill uh, David. And, and they had this parting together, which is described in 1 Samuel. David bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. They kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. Jonathan said to David, go in peace. David left and Jonathan went back to the town. So they let each other go for, the, for David's sake, for his safety. Uh, and of course he then went on to take over from Saul as, as king. And then of course Jesus let go of his life. Jesus said, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down. In other words, he physically laid it down. He let go of his life. When he received the, the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed up his head and gave up his spirit. Oh yes, he was crucified, but actually he was also in control. He let go. I want to just share with you finally about uh, a guy I met a long time ago now. He was in fact 24 years ago. Um, almost to the day and um, and this is a, just another ex example of a Christian life and I, I, I want to use the example of him in a sense to tie up some of the things I've said about um, Timothy, Epaphroditus and Paul. Reinhardt was a missionary, a German missionary doctor and he worked in western Nepal. He worked around uh, a place called Nepalgunge. It was a uh, a very poor, mainly rural community. Nepalganj is a, a city with a small airport, but actually the area where he's working was, was very poor. He worked with an organization called INF, the International Nepal Fellowship, and he served, I think it was, I don't know exactly how long, but I know he served in the 80s and the 90s. Um, 
and he provided general medical and particularly TB, TB specialist care. Um, and in fact, um, I, I digress for a minute, the, some of the guys working uh, in TB care developed uh, uh, schemes to help treat people in rural communities and they did some research into this and the, and the, the methods that they used were actually uh, taken up by the World Health Organization. I mean these guys were, you know, and I, it was my privilege to sort of just to visit them back in uh, July, August 2000. Um, Reinhardt was aged uh, in his 50s, he was a single man, but he was, he was Christ's servant, he was a co-worker in INF and he served far from his home and my observation was him of him was he was a disciplined reliable faithful guy he was but he was quiet and humble and thoughtful he wasn't in your face at all but like Epaphroditus he became ill and he was transferred by friends from uh, uh, from the western Nepal to Pokhara uh, in the centre of Nepal, that's the kind of tourist centre, but also INF had their main uh, compound, their main offices in, um, in Pokhara. And he was brought to the house of an, uh, another INF worker who was a nurse, uh, and he actually came under my care because in July and August I was on sabbatical, and I was commissioned by the Baptist Missionary Society to work um, to just effectively do a locum, to be a GP for the INF staff in um, Pokhara. And this, and uh, Reinhardt came under my care and he was very unwell. And he, he, he was up and down but his condition was essentially, he was deteriorating over a period of a couple of weeks that I looked after him. And um, we did some tests, examined him frequently, but we didn't quite know what was wrong with him. I had my suspicions, but I wasn't sure. Um, we just didn't have the facilities to know. Um, the amazing thing about Reinhardt, like Timothy, he actually took a genuine interest to me. This is quite paradoxical, really. He was the patient, but he was asking me about myself and how, how I was. And I immediately felt this bond between him, as if that we, even though I'd only known him for a few days, we were brothers in Christ, we were the same Christian family. And actually he was a very humble guy. Um, I asked him, I asked Ryan, can I make arrangements to get some of your stuff from, you know, Western Nepal to, because you're going to be, you might be here for a while, can I make arrangements to get your stuff over? Of course I felt fairly humbled when he said, actually, I really don't have much stuff at all, um, you know, and all I need is my Bible, my notebook, which was a work of art in itself. It was like, you know, had loads of things written in it, and, and I, I just need a change of clothes. That's all I need. And, uh, and we discussed options regarding his care and so on. And, and basically, he, he just agreed... Um, he just but trusted me to do what was in his best interest. Um, in many ways he was getting too sick to make those kind of decisions but uh, nevertheless it was a mark of his humility that he was able to trust. And so I, like Paul, had this genuine dilemma. He was getting worse, should, I, should he go back to Germany or remain in Nepal with all his friends that he'd had for 15-20 years? And I genuinely felt Marimna, I was, I cared for him, but I was also really worried about him, um, I, I, you know, because it was a difficult situation. In many ways, I was the new kid on the block. I'd only been there two weeks. I'd never worked abroad. And I had this, you know, wonderful Christian man. He was like deteriorating um, before my eyes. And I kind of thought that he might have a condition that was curable uh, in Western, in, in a Western hospital. Uh, I thought he might have a condition which was possibly 90% curable, uh, but not without appropriate treatment. So I, I wrote a report about him, I faxed it to an insurance company, and I remember, I think it was a Saturday or Sunday night, I had a midnight call from German Air Rescue, and within 24 hours, they'd sorted him out. They had an air ambulance with a nurse escort, and they transported him to Pokhara, Kathmandu, 
via the Middle East, Germany, no questions asked. And um, that was, for me, a bit of a miracle, really. Um, you know, it was, it was great. Um, the, the thing about him, his friends, um, th they initially, to be honest, didn't want him to go. I, I, I think in some ways we, they didn't quite understand how sick he was getting, uh, but of course I was, I was seeing that with my own eyes. But, but they genuinely wanted the best for him. But in the end, they were willing to let him go. And one of his colleagues, who a sister in Christ, two days later, she got a flight to, Nepal, to Germany and she went to make sure he was getting everything he needed. Um, that was, you know, like Epaphrodite, you were willing to go a long way to help him. I, I wrote, I, I, I've been keeping a journal for 40 years now, and uh, I look back at my journal there, and I, I, I just look back at what I'd written, because I'd forgotten I'd written this. This was the day after he was transferred to Germany. And I just wrote, pray for Rain, Reinhard, thank you that our lives crossed for a brief time. For me, it was a, just a privilege to meet Reinhard. Now, unlike Epaphroditus, he didn't get better. I heard, and this is hearsay, that he was in a teaching hospital for a few months, that he had a complex condition which was obviously not amenable to treatment, and eventually he went to live with his sister in Germany who cared for him until his death. But what I do remember about um, Reinhardt, sorry, it's 20, 24 years. He, he was a disciple. Yeah, he was a brother, faithful servant, and he was a Christ like man. But for Reinhardt, to live was Christ, to die was gain. Amen. Thank you.